my Adore, my 64, my Commodore 64. Hi there, and welcome to a Let's Type episode from the Commodore 64 Appreciation Society. This is a series where I reach back into the past and type out a program from an old computer magazine, and then when I finish typing it in, I play it. November 1985 was a memorable time. Rocky Balboa was gearing up to trade punches with Ivan Drago, Starship was boldly insisting that we built this city, and Microsoft had just unleashed a little program called Windows, which amazingly would go on to become slightly more successful than New Coke. Meanwhile, in Eugene, Oregon, a mid-tier publication called Home Computer Magazine, or HCM, was doing its part to support the rapidly growing home computer scene with technical articles, software reviews, and most importantly, type-in programs. The November 85 issue featured a mix of games and utilities, including Surf City for the Commodore 64, which I'll be typing in and playing in this video. The idea for this one came from a viewer, who mentioned the game in a comment on one of our other videos. I haven't heard of either the game or the magazine before, so this one should be fun to dig into. Before we jump in, a quick reminder that if you have any suggestions for type-ins that you'd like to see featured, let me know in the comments. Also, there are plenty more of these on the channel. I've dropped a link in the description if you want to check them out. So, without further ado, let's wax those boards and head to Surf City. <laughs> oh wait, that's not what this is about at all. This surf city takes place in 985 AD and it's focused on the farm fields of feudal Europe. There were no surfboards, no beaches, and absolutely no one was hanging 10, though there were plenty of surfs. Surf City is an economic simulation written by William K. Balthrop, conceptually similar to what we've seen in games like Mule, Oil Barons, and the various stock market simulations that floated around in the 80s. It's a two-player game where each participant takes the role of a rival lord. The goal is to outmaneuver and eventually overwhelm the other through clever management of farms, resources, and military strength. It's a fun premise, and games like this can be a blast with a friend. But before I can get to that, I'll first need to type in Bug Out, Home Computer Magazine's proofreader, because nothing ruins a kingdom faster than a mistyped line of basic. Bugout might be the most interesting proofreader I've ever seen. Typically, proofreaders, like the ones featured in Compute and Ahoy, sit quietly in memory and display a checksum after each line you type. If the checksum matches the one printed in the magazine, you're good. If it doesn't, you know instantly that you've messed something up and can fix it on the spot. They're fantastic tools that can make typing these programs surprisingly painless. Bugout uses the same basic concept, but takes a very different approach. Instead of checking your lines in real time, it waits until you finish entering the entire program. Only then does it comb through your listing and give you a report showing which line numbers need correction. It's more of a post-mortem proofreader than a live one. It's an interesting twist and I'm genuinely curious to see how well it works in practice. Fortunately, the program is extremely short, just 45 lines, nine of which are REM statements. So this won't be an afternoon long typing marathon. As expected, I got bug out working quickly and with only a couple of minor issues. And in kind of an inception-like move, we can actually test it out on itself. That's right, HCM included proofreading checksums for their proofreading program. I can't quite tell whether that's silly or genius, but it does give us a perfect way to see how well bug out does its thing. Before we can run it, we first need to save a version of the program as a sequential text file, which Bugout can then open and parse. Doing that requires the following lines. These commands save a file called bugout4.t to disk. I can now enter that file name within Bugout, display it to screen, and here we go. Oh cool, it's stepping through each line and giving me a single letter as a checksum. I can now follow along in the magazine and see how they compare. It looks like there are two errors, one in line 220 and one in 240. Huh, 
220 looks perfectly fine. I've checked it out a few times now. Oh, wait. There are two spaces before F$ dollar sign in the listing and only one in mine. That can't be the problem, can it? Let's make the change and see. Well, there you go. That was the problem. Once I added that extra space and re-ran bug out, the checksums matched perfectly. Line 240 had the same sort of hiccup. Wow, that's unfortunate. Ideally, a proofreader should ignore non-essential characters like that. I guess that just means I'll need to be extra careful. Fortunately, the way Home Computer Magazine laid out their listings actually makes it very easy to count spaces. I've never seen programs printed in a grid quite like this before. I can definitely see the benefit, especially for lines that have a lot of white space. But it's also a bit rough on the eyes. Hopefully, it's something I'll get used to as I go. The story of HCM is kind of a fascinating one. Gary Kaplan originally launched the magazine in 1981 as 99er Home Computer Magazine, focused on the TI-99. A few years later, the 99er was dropped as the magazine broadened its focus to support a wider range of home computers. The magazine ran in that more general home computer magazine form until November 1985, which is actually the issue we're looking at in this video. And here's where things take a strange turn. Not long after, Kaplan resurfaced in a consulting role with a new publication called Home Computing Journal. This magazine was significantly more expensive, some say $25 an issue, and existing HCM subscribers were basically just left out in the cold. It's quite the twisty little tale, and honestly, it's a bit hard to find a ton of reliable detail on either HCM or Home Computer Journal. If you have any memories or details of either, please drop a note in the comments. One of the coolest features of Home Computer Magazine was its Programmer's Window section. In this part of the magazine, the editors walk through each type-in program, explaining how it worked, listing the variables, and even providing a sort of map that showed which sections of code handled which parts of the program. A resource like this was like a cheat sheet, both for understanding the software and, even more deviously, learning how to exploit the game and gain the upper hand against a friend. After all, once you know the formula to determine success, it's much easier to plan your kingdom accordingly. Other magazines like Compute occasionally went into similar detail, but almost never to this level. The programmer's window was a really impressive feature for anyone interested in the whys behind the code. Okay, I'm just finishing up here. This definitely feels like one of the longest ones that I've typed in so far. And yeah, after saving it and looking at it on disk, it takes up 42 blocks, or about 10.5k. Before we use bug out, let's try running the game to see how I did with typing it in. Cool, here's the intro screen. And I love that it's telling me not to panic when the screen goes blank. Oh, and here's that blank screen. And here it still is. This obviously isn't right. There isn't a timer or anything, but I let it run for a couple of minutes and I think the computer has crashed. This right here is an important lesson for all you typists out there. Always save your program before running it. Well, I think I'll take this as a sign that I should run the program through bug out, which I'll do now. And here we go. So right now, I have my emulator up running bug out. Behind that is the listing in Home Computer Magazine with the checksums. And then beside all of this is a notebook that I'm using to scribble down the line numbers where there is an error. And there are quite a few of them, 38 in total. This is actually just a faster version of what I normally call a code review. In those, I'll go through the whole program to compare it with what was in the magazine, fixing issues as I run into them. 
In this, I'm getting a list of all the line numbers that are wrong, which speeds up the process quite a bit. It's pretty cool, actually. Most of the issues I've hit so far have just been basic typos. You know, the classics. I'll accidentally type a square bracket instead of a colon, or I'll miss a character entirely because apparently my keyboard demands a sacrifice. Some errors showed up on the long, intricate lines where various values are being calculated. Those definitely would have produced some interesting gameplay moments. Then there were lines like 2740, where I managed to botch a poke statement. In that case, I typed 40 times 7 instead of 40 times Z, which would absolutely have caused some major chaos. I bungled a couple of other pokes as well, and one of those is almost certainly what triggered the crash. There was one checksum error that I'm intentionally not fixing, and that's in line 2720. Home Computing Magazine actually misspelled commerce in their listing, so I corrected it. If the magazine had continued beyond that issue, I imagine they would have printed a correction eventually, but since they didn't, well, someone had to do it. Okay, that's the end of the bugs. I like the process. It's not as foolproof as Compute's automatic proofreader, but it's quite accurate and also allows for a bit of that thrill you get from finding and fixing errors. But most importantly, with the errors now out of the way, we can play the game. Okay, here's that dreaded blank screen. And we passed it. Nice. It's a two-player game, but I'm all alone now, so I'll play against Flag, my evil doppelganger. Here's the main screen. I can see my land, 12, my mills, 1, the population, 90, and my wheat and gold, both at 500. Wow, there's a lot to keep track of here. And cool, here's a map that shows my current holdings. The idea is that you want to expand your land, which you can buy with the L key, and once you have enough to be touching your rival's land, the military gets involved. But I'm just trying to figure this out, so none of that on this turn. Okay, right now I just want to make sure that none of my serfs starve, so I press W for wheat. The instructions say that each person needs 5 bushels a year to survive. I have 90 people, so that means I should allocate 450, which pretty much gets rid of my wheat. I'll put the rest to seed and we'll see how that goes. And I've got a bit of extra money, so how about hiring some soldiers? I don't even know if I need them right now, but 5 doesn't seem like a lot, and I'll pay them 20 each, so 100 gold. There isn't much else to do at this point, so let's send it over to player 2. Flag is going to take a different strategy and we'll start buying land. Next, he'll feed his people and plant some seed. Actually, let's buy some more wheat and plant lots of seed. Okay, that's the end of his turn. I think player 1 did pretty well. I harvested 950 bushels, and we can see the employment spread between wheat, mill, and commerce. I don't really understand how it all works yet, but that seems okay. Oh, and <laughs> I guess I paid my soldiers 100 gold each. Oops. Well, at least they're probably happy. And oh wow, flag strategy was way worse. The entire population was growing wheat because I planted too much. I brought in a lot, but everyone left. 67 people moved away and 16 died. That's 83 people. So Flag is just down to 7 really stubborn folks. I think this is going to be a short game. Okay, turn 2, and the year changed to 986. We can see that I've accumulated a score now, 311, but my population is down a bit, and I've spent all my gold on 5 soldiers. Let's see if I can increase the population by giving everyone a bit more wheat. I have 85 people, so we'll provide about 6 bushels per person by allocating 500 in total. That leaves me with a lot of wheat left. Let's plant 150 this time and sell the rest. Oh cool, 1200 gold. I can use that to buy a bunch more land. Okay, turn done. Oh no, I meant to fix the soldier's pay. 
Well, I guess this kingdom will continue to have the best paid soldiers. Flank has far fewer options, and I'm surprised that his score still seems pretty good. He has 279 compared to my 311. But also, he's only down to 7 people. They may be lonely, but at least they'll eat well. So let's allocate 50 wheat, about 7 bushels each, and we'll put 200 bushels to seed and sell a bunch for some quick money. I think that's good for now. Let's see how we did. Oh man, well that wrecked it. All of the employment went to wheat because I planted too much. And with everyone working the fields, there was no one to process the wheat and engage in commerce. So everyone was working hard, but had nothing to eat and no money to make. So they all left. 70 deserted and 15 died. Huh, I should have learned that from Flag's first turn. And heading over to Flag, we can see the same basic situation here. With all seven people working the fields, there was no one to actually turn it into food. Oh, and the rats ate 109 bushels. Well, at least the rats are doing well. Oh, and we have a winner. Okay, cool. Huh. So I stalled at a score of 281. And Flag... Jumped to 733. It must have been all the money he had. <laughs> Why is it always the evil guy who wins? What a deep game. Strategy games like this can take some time to learn but are a ton of fun once you get down the basics. Next time, I will be much more careful with the amount of weed I plant. William Balthrop did a great job developing this, and it was a lot of fun to type in and play. He also wrote a few other games for HCM, and I'm looking forward to trying them too. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribing. And if you have any experiences with Surf City, home computer magazine, or typing in your own programs, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Hope to see you again.